Hi there, my name is Memo, this is my channel, House Planty Goodness, and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big fashion. You might be able to see some of it behind me, it's tropical houseplants. So today's definitely going to be a different type of video, because today I'm actually not going to be talking about houseplants. So if you're only here for the houseplanty love, I'll link a few videos or a playlist essentially up the top, you can go and check that out, but everybody else who is asking for kind of my journey with vegetables and the allotment that I was dealing with all of last summer. I know there's a, quite a few of you actually that wanted to know. This one is for you. And also let me know if you enjoy this. I can create a bit more of a more of a sporadic series for this because obviously things take time when it's vegetables and it's allotment and it's the very beginning of the growing season here in the UK because we're kind of, at the time of filming this, we're kind of in the middle of March, basically. And some of the things that I'm doing today, I've probably left a bit too long, but it's because of learnings that I had from last year. But before we go into any of that, let me give you some background on kind of how I started with vegetables, the allotment, all of the above, basically. Luckily, I've actually got some pictures of the allotment when I first got it. So I'll be kind of interspersing it throughout the video, at least in this section. But the story goes, I bought the house and moved into the house. And then a couple of weeks later, and I put my name down for an allotment. For the people that are not based in the UK, an allotment is something that's usually, I can't remember if it's through the council of the area that you're in, but basically you put your name down. And if and when you're selected, basically, they give you a small plot of land to cultivate usually for vegetables or fruit and things like that. And it's usually on a much larger plot. So one plot will have multiple allotment plots on it. And usually this isn't a particularly expensive thing, really. I think the one that I have at the moment, which is 11 meters by 11 meters, is, I'm trying to remember now, maybe 30 uh, Great British pounds a year. So it really isn't that much, basically. And it covers some of the costs of kind of maintaining the wider plot. But I put my name down because anybody who lives in the UK knows that it can take a very long time. And by very long time, usually it could also mean years. But <laughs> as luck would have it, two weeks after I, was, I moved into this house and I was still moving in, <laughs> anybody who's moved house knows that it doesn't take a couple of days. It takes a few weeks or months, basically, until you're fully unpacked. It came up and they were just like, we've actually got a plot that's just become available. Do you want it? And I'm just like, oh, really? I should say no, because I've got too many things on. But at the same time, I'm just sitting there going, this has come available now. They can offer it to me now if I take it now. If I don't, I might be waiting years potentially to take it. So I'm just like, ah, OK. So I went and saw the plot. As sadly, a lot of people might know in the UK, a lot of the times the only way that you do get a plot is because possibly somebody who had the plot has passed away. And I think that's pretty much what happened with my plot, the previous plot owner or renter or tenant, I don't know technically what the right terminology is there, had passed away. And I think that individual, he'd kind of left the plot to kind of grow a bit wild towards the end because I think he was quite poorly and quite ill. So that was fine, but I kind of went and hopefully I've got an image here. It, the image doesn't do it justice because the weed was almost as tall as I am and I'm about one meter 77. So, <laughs> uh, so obviously there's nothing like electric. There's at my specific allotment, there's nothing like running water either. So it's starting from scratch and you you kind of had to cut your way in through the weeds. So I had <laughs> a plot of 11 meters by 11 meters of weeds. <laughs> Some of them quite tenacious. So fast forward, I was kind of trimming everything down. I ended up, because um, I needed it for the garden here, I ended up getting uh, an electric lawnmower. So I was able to, so with batteries basically, so I was able to take it there and clear a lot of it down, either that or with a strimmer. And that was all cleared. Little did I know that a couple of weeks later, after I'd done all of this work and it took weeks and many weekends to clear all of that up, in the beginning I went with like <laughs> the large secretaire that I was cutting through it. I was like, this is taking forever and I am not a spring chicken anymore. <laughs> I cannot be doing this. Um, 
and it was during the summer as well, so it was quite warm. The problem is I got that plot by the time I'd kind of been able to move into that plot and do anything with it, I'd missed the growing season for that year, basically, because I just didn't have the time to prep things and do things and get in. So I thought, you know what, that first year, I'm just going to spend bringing the plot up to a standard that actually the next growing season will be a lot easier for me. So yeah, cleared all the weeds. Um, I saw, and it's a good thing if you're doing anything like this, learn from the people around you. Most of the people that have got allotment plots, if you catch them there whilst you're there, they are more than happy to have a chat. It's very much a community thing anyway. So learn from them. And one of the things that I kind of picked up really quickly from a lot of them, because they were complaining about it, is how often they had to go back, even with their established plots, in the summer to do weeding. So... I had a bit of time and I had enough time to save up some money and I got a lot of weed suppressing membrane. So I carved out the paths around the allotment, uh, just where I knew, I knew where the beds were going to be, I knew where I was going to put the beds and pretty much everything had a weed suppressing membrane. The middle bits that were going to be turning into the kind of aisles or the corridors, I put down some wood chip. I found a relatively good deal on really cheap wood chips. So I put that down. I knew a lot of other people, some of them, what they do is they might put mulch or they might put rocks. That takes forever and it's very expensive. Some other people have done grass. And I think grass might have been a good idea. The thing that put me off it is there's one more thing I then need to know. And I really cannot be bothered. But it's based on what I'm seeing from other people's plot two years later now. It's a good way of suppressing some of those weeds. However, I put the weed membrane down and I put the bark on top. Spoiler, some of the weeds still came through that. <laughs> um, but the other thing I really didn't want to do with the plot as much as possible is disturb the soil. Because I would assume the soil has got quite a good network of beneficial fungi and microbes and all of these things. And there is kind of a notion of a lot of people saying the, least, the less you handle the soil, the better it will be for its health. Because a lot of heavy kind of digging and things like that or um, kind of like essentially like raking everything up, you're kind of breaking some of those bonds, especially because I've used mycorrhizal fungi for a lot of my house plants, and I know how the kind of fungi roots work, and it's kind of a big network. I didn't want to disturb that too much, so I did that. It's fine. Hopefully this year the weeds will be even weaker by the time they come back, and I'll stay, I'll try to stay on top of it correct myself there because <laughs> but I do have a lot less weeding to do than everybody else and what I did with the beds because there was a weed membrane I just cut through the membrane and planted in those areas basically so kind of a bit no dig but not doing it the proper no dig way with all the different layers and actually again a bit of a spoiler I had good success this year so I'm probably going to be following something similar again this year so at that point the plot was ready to receive vegetables. And last year, and again, I'm giving you a bit of, this is going to be a bit of a hefty background section, but I want to give you some context as well, because the people that have been around my channel for a while, and they've seen my houseplants, a lot of you know the histories and the stories behind a lot of these things. You don't know anything about this. I'm going to bring you up to speed. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's one of those things that everything was ready. And last year, I started planting up my seeds, which is what I'm going to be doing day with you and I'll talk you through at least some of my process based on things that I've learned along the way through last year, some trial and error situations and we'll kind of go from there really. But the plantlets were ready to plant out. That's another thing that you kind of need to judge on your region of the world if you're starting seeds indoors, which is what I'm doing at the moment because it's too cold for it to be outdoors at this time of the year in the UK. So at that stage, you need to time it well because you need to not only know roughly how long the seeds are going to take to germinate, but also how long they're going to take to get to a certain stage where they're hardy enough that you can start hardening them off outside. And by hardening them off outside, I'm fortunate enough to have a greenhouse. But if you don't and you're not going to be doing a huge amount of them, you could just take them out when it starts warming up, but it, you're not entirely sure if they're ready yet. Take them out each morning, leave them outside, 
The temperatures will fluctuate throughout the day more than they would ever would do in your house. There'll also be a bit of wind, so the roots will start strengthening up as well. And then just bring them in at night. Usually, if you've got a big tray, you can just carry the tray in at night overnight, just because those nighttime temperatures drop really, really low. That's another thing you need to be aware of when you're doing things like this, is specifically your nighttime temperatures. Daytime temperatures, usually by the time you're getting into early to mid spring, are, ta- are starting to get a bit warmer. Obviously, if you're gonna have a frost or a hard frost, don't put them out. <laughs> but usually the nighttime temperatures are the ones that drop significantly and they get to the single figures in terms of Celsius, basically. And that's where it gets a bit risky. So yeah, just making sure that you bring them back in and then planting them out. But the thing that I learned last year, because we had the unseasonable heat wave, where essentially we had a summer in the UK that rivaled my summer in Greece, they needed a lot of watering. And remember what I said, there was no running water at the plot. And I had set up a small um, shed. I'd also set up a polytunnel. And with the shed, I was trying to put some drainage off the roof to feed into a water butt. Did not do that very well. So I kind of lost most of that year. And by the time I put in the shed and the water butt, we'd started to get quite dry. So it didn't collect any water at all, really. Luckily, I have fixed it this year. And I am very glad and very proud to say after two years, I am now collecting water. (laughs) Just to be clear, last year, I was filling up um, those kind of jerry cans and I think I was carrying 100 litres of water in the morning from here to the plot, moving it to the plot, putting it into the water butt, filling up the watering cans to then water <laughs> in the morning and in the evening, twice a day of it, for most of the summer, as well as having to deal with probably at this point over 600 house plants and about um, half an hour to an hour of watering both in the back garden and the front garden. So <laughs> summertime is busy. <laughs> but I'm all about trying to make things as efficient as possible. And actually, if you're going to be growing anything like this in your garden and an allotment, maybe even in a house as well, you kind of want to make it as efficient as you possibly can because you don't want to be spending hours doing this. Maybe you do. And if you do, take your time and enjoy the process. No judgment from me. But yeah, let's go into potting up some of these seeds. I know this is a very, very long intro section, but hopefully I've had clips and videos that I could insert here and pictures. And hopefully it's kept it a bit more interesting rather than me just blathering on. So the one thing I will say when you're starting seeds, if you can, it's not always going to be easy. And I was lucky enough that I had this because I bought bedding plants and stuff like that. But I kept them from like things like the garden centre. These are really, really good purely in terms of saving some space. And I usually keep this in the shed over the winter, basically. But if you'd imagine the small, small round pots, there's a lot of wasted space between them. This one, you can put quite a few... So we're looking at here, I think this is 10, 10 cell. I can get quite a few seeds in here without it taking up that much space. If I was doing that with around individual pots, it would have taken up a lot more space. And space is at a premium because I start my seeds in here with a grow light. I sometimes will use a seed mat, so a heat mat for the first couple of days until they germinate. And then I'll kind of pull back on that and probably just switch it off. I, I tried running it for longer last year. And a lot of my plants got really leggy and it's harder for you to unplant them. The roots can also dry out too quickly. Uh, it was too much of an issue. So yes, and I would have actually preferred them in hindsight to go a bit slower because I had things that were ready before the weather was ready. If <laughs> that makes sense. So I was like trying to juggle things around. <laughs> Not doing that again, hopefully this year. So yeah, having something like these types of cells, the other big thing, and I'm giving you my tips along the way, Yours might different, and if you've got, whilst I knock everything down, if you've got your own little tips and you've done things like this before, either in your own garden or in allotment, do share that below. I'm sure myself and a lot of other people would like to learn. Invest in plant tags. Find ones that are rewritable, and again, learn learn from my mistakes. Use a pencil not a pen or a marker because with a pencil you can usually rub it off and it will come off and you can use it again next year if you've used a permanent marker or a pen sometimes it's a lot harder and you need to faff around with it too much and there's no point of buying plastic over and over again and to be fair you don't need to buy these things i think uh wooden lolly sticks as well a slightly more um green version of that um, i think with that would be i'm a bit worried because it's sitting in damp soil all the time so these do me well. And the other big thing that I do use or I'm going to be using as of this year, last year I had little 
kind of handwritten calendar and I'd kind of organized everything into spreadsheets because I am that weirdo, um, just to know when things need to be planted, when I'm going to be getting the yield and all these things. So the other big thing to consider is if you're planting everything now and everything's going to fruit or kind of produce the vegetables at the same time, you're going to have a lot of stuff to put in now and you're going to have a lot of harvest at the end. And it might not seem like a big problem and you just thought it's going to be great. No, it really won't because you're just not going to have space to get everything in your house. You're going to be gifting it to right people right, left and center. And you might just leave it on for it to rot because you just don't have anything to do with it. And then if you haven't got another batch of vegetables coming up after that, you're done. And that's it for the year. So plan ahead. So I'm going to be planting some seeds now that need to be started now, but I'm also going to probably be planting some seeds more, more or less every week this month, next month, and the next month, just to get things ready so I've got crops that are happening. You also want to make sure that you're kind of staggering growth of things. So let me give you an idea. So that's a bad example, but mm, celery. So I'm going to be planting some celery seeds. Now, celery is something that I use a lot, especially in the summer. And what I want to do is obviously plant a few now so that the ones that I've planted now will kind of be ready at around the same time. And then I might plant some a month later just so that those ones will be ready to harvest a month later. So you see what I mean? You're staggering your kind of seed starting out just so that it doesn't all come into fruition at the same time. This is also going to take a very long time, possibly. So seed packets are really good to look at as well, because what you will see is, and if I bring this up closer, you might be able to see, hopefully this isn't, it might be mirroring it. If it is, I'll see if I can flip this section around. But what you should be able to see, and actually let me bring it up so you can kind of see what I'm seeing, and then I can actually be reading another seed packet. You've got the calendar months at the top, where you need to be sowing things, if you need to be planting them out, if you've started them indoors, when you're probably likely going to be harvesting them, what the picture of a seedling might look like. This one was good, actually, because I quite like the fact that it's got seedling pictures. And then it also tells you roughly how wide and how tall that plant might end up becoming, just so you've got an idea. The other thing that I found was quite useful, and this might not be for everybody because this comes with a bit of a cost, basically. I found a website over here, I think it's called Grow Vegetables or Grow Veg, and I'll link it down below. It's 25 pounds for the year, and it might seem like a lot if you're not gonna use it very often, and I'm not saying get it. I don't have, this is obviously not sponsored, but it's been good because I can plan what I'm gonna put where, it also tells you of interaction with plants. It tells you roughly how large of an area those plants are going to need when they're established. It also tells you, oh, if you're planting this here, this next this year, next year you should be planting something else there because of the way that things are nitrogen fixing and nitrogen leaching, basically. So I think that's how it goes. So some plants, so brassicas will pull a lot of the nitro, uh, a lot of the nutrients out of the soil, but they don't put any back in. The beans and legumes and stuff like that will put a lot of nutrients or nitrogen, I think it is nitrogen, back into the soil. So what you don't want to be doing is growing beans at the same time or in the same place because they will have too much of that into the soil again. And if you've got brassicas and kales and things like that at the same place, they'll keep leaching out. The quality of that soil isn't going to be good. So making sure that next year you rotate that around so that you're kind of utilizing and it's not kind of over depleting or over kind of creating, I guess. Again, I told you, this is not my thing. A class plant, I can talk a bit more scientifically. These things I'm kind of finding out as I'm going along. It was hysterical, side note. The whole thing has been a side note so far. I haven't even started planting seeds yet and we're 20 minutes in. Uh, when I got the plot at the allotment, essentially, and a lot of people, and I was kind of telling them about the house plants, and some of them had obviously noticed the house because they're all kind of around the same neighborhood as me. And they're just like, you're the one with all the plants in the windows. So people started to ask me questions about vegetables and their plots. And I'm just like, no, 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 no. I've got some basic knowledge because I'm growing plants as a whole, but I'm growing tropical plants. They are very different. <laughs> to a certain point, at least do vegetable plants. So I'm just like, you should be the ones giving me advice, not the other way around. But actually along the years, we have kind of exchanged 
fun stories and things that we've learned along the way. And it's been spectacular, basically. Right. Let's get into some planting. The other thing that I was going to say is I have always ever used Coco Coir to do my seed starting. It is essentially peat moss free. So, and I found that it is quite good. The other thing that I will usually do with this, I'll bring the bucket up, is add something in either like sand or vermiculite just to create a bit of aeration. So I'm just going to add that in really, really quickly. Because you need to remember with these seedlings, or essentially the seeds when they start growing in, they will be having very fine roots. So you just want to make sure that they are getting as much moisture as they need. Unlike a lot of our aroids, this needs a tiny bit more moisture. Obviously, you're not wanting to sit in boggy water, but this needs water when it's starting, especially if it's getting high light from a grow light or a very bright window. So just bear that in mind. The other thing that I will say, and this is something that I learned over the years, whether or not it's a good or bad thing to do, I always try it with this soil, with the seed starting soil. You really don't want too many other microorganisms in here because it could cause issues with your seedlings when they're starting off. When they're a bit bigger and a bit more established and you're going to be transplanting them in the soil, of course you want that there. But one of the things that I will do is, so a lot of the times with the cocoa coir, you get it in little bricks and you need to rehydrate it. What I will do in that situation is, and I won't do it in a plastic bucket, obviously, but I will pour boiling water in order for that to kind of swell up a bit more. And that kills off most of the things in there. Obviously, I need to let it cool down and then I can do everything that I need to do with it. But essentially, that is the big thing. Just see if you can maybe sterilize your growing media. You don't have to. I didn't do it last year. I didn't have too many problems. But a lot of the people that I was talking to just like, it is a good practice to get into because you'd be really annoyed if you started some vegetables and they're dying off because you just didn't take that extra minute with the soil before you planted them in. This is going to get messy. It always gets messy. So have something underneath you that you can kind of catch any of the soil spillage. So making sure that you're filling in. I've already mixed the vermiculite into the cocoa coir. And I'm trying to reuse elements of things that we probably, if you've got houseplants, you've probably maybe got some of these things in your own space. So I'm trying to make it so that you don't have to, if you're looking to get into this, you don't have to get new things necessarily. And it's also more likely that if you're using materials that you're used to using, you'll be a bit more comfortable with them. If I was kind of saying, do this and do this and try this that you've never tried before, you'd be a bit more, eh, do, am I doing this right? At least with this, you kind of know because you've probably done something similar potentially for some of your houseplants. The other thing of note when it comes to, and you're seeing me tapping things down, is I want it to compact a bit. I want it to still be fluffy, and it will be because of that vermiculite having those air bubbles in. But just so that it keeps its shape, you will thank me for that later on when you're trying to pull these things out. Because <laughs> they can be a bit. Um, but the other thing that I would say is, if you're getting something like Coco Quark, don't get one that has got essentially fertilizer already enriched within it because sometimes you can get those ones that have already got fertilizer in it these don't need it the one thing that i am using this year that i didn't use last year and this is something that a company called suttons which does a lot of seeds over here offer as an extra if they're sending you kind of plug plants and things like that to start off with or seeds not seeds plug plants is using something that they call maxi crop basically and this is a big one, but a lot of reviews are really good on this. I don't know. I've not used it before. If you've used it before, have you had good successes with this? But essentially, it's a plant growth stimulant. It's not a fertilizer. It is, I think, pretty much. So it, it's a seaweed extract. I would imagine Super Thrive is, is kind of similar to this. But this one you can use for germinating seeds, propagating, transplanting, growing on mature seeds, fruit crops, and lawns as well. So it smells as you would imagine that it would smell, and it's black color, but the dog loves it. The dog absolutely loves it. Anything like this that stinks, both Duke and Lola, the previous dog, go crazy for. But let's see how it goes. But I'm using that this year at least to get going. So. Planning ahead. So one of the things that I was going to say, remember what I said, celery. So celery, I want to be planting out. 
And I can see here that I can sow it in March and April. Most of the seeds that I've got in front of me are for planting out now or sowing into cells now. It's then saying plant out in May or June. So this is going to be in here or at least in the conservatory at some point until May, probably May or June, depending on when it starts getting warmer. And the harvest for these will hopefully be between June and October. So it gives you a bit of a range. It's kind of one of those things. So if you start them really early and you've had a good kind of warm few weeks or months, you might be able to start harvesting in June. So, and it kind of goes like that really. So if I was maybe to start something in April, some of these seeds in April, they're more likely to be kind of July or August, or sorry, July to October is when this is. So at the earliest I'll get a crop in July, I then might get, if I start a month later, I might get it in August. So obviously read something else about this as well, because this is saying, sow the seeds indoors, in pots or trays, and only go 0.5 centimeters deep. Now, things that I've learned over the years. Essentially, what you need to remember with a seed is if a seed, essentially you bury the seed two or three times its thickness down in the soil. So if it's something tiny, you might not even need to put a layer of soil over it. You might just be able to just put it on top of the soil. If it's a thicker seed, and I will show you some of the beans, for instance, that can go a bit deeper, essentially, because that can actually uh, come through the soil. So with this, just make sure you're opening the seed packets. The other thing that I would say, usually, and it's a really bad place, they usually have expiration date for the seed. So from what I'm seeing online, it's not necessarily that you need to all throw them away if they've gone past their expiration date, but this is what the people that are packaging these seeds would say, okay, this is where we're kind of guaranteeing that the seeds should be okay. You might run into some problems after that. So, but it is good to keep that on there if you can. It's just usually really annoying that they've got it on the worst bit of the actual packaging ever because you're gonna rip it out. So the interesting thing with this one, it comes with a little tag. So making sure if you're gonna do a cell full of these plants, have one tag. If you're gonna mix and match, every single cell it's going to need its own thing because trust me when these start growing you won't be able to tell the difference a lot of the times so i'm making sure that i'm putting that in and i need to then open up the seeds and let's have a look so these seeds are absolutely tiny so this is a tricky thing because a lot of the times in each cell, you might only want to put one or two. You don't want them to crowd too much, but it also, if you put two in there or three, you can kind of remove and discard ones that are a bit weaker and keep the stronger ones. Or you don't even need to discard the ones that are weaker. If you've got somebody else's growing, you can swap some of those weaker seedlings and eventually you both might get some vegetables coming from there if you don't want to get rid of those seeds entirely. So these are absolutely minuscule. So I will see about putting one or two in each cell and probably just a dusting of some of the soil on top. Right, that's enough. That really wasn't very much that I could tap out, but I usually I got about three or four in each cell. That's probably a bit too much, but it's, it's hard sometimes to kind of do this in a different way. So that is ready. And what I would do is instead of just getting something like a trowel or anything like that, just a bit of dusting of some of this on top. The good thing is this is qua that is pre-dampened a bit, so it will take water a lot readily. If you're going in with something that's bone dry, I would advise against it. I did that last year by mistake. A lot of the water will just run off and a lot of the times it will run off with the seed in it as well. So pre-moistened will means that it will take the water a lot better when you're putting the water through. So I'll give you some example of some bigger seeds. So I've got butter beans, which I am Greek and I am super excited about this. Anybody who is Greek will know why I'm excited about butter beans. And if you are Greek, this is gigantis, which essentially translates to uh, giant, basically, because they can be big beans. Uh, but again, they always have the dates at the bottom, which invariably is the bit that will rip when you're trying to open it up. Yeah, of course it does. Um, 
It's one of those things that I'm listening again. Could you have not have done it in a different way? But you know. So yes, you can see. I mean, <laughs> it's beans. It's beans, but that is considerably bigger. The ones, the celery ones, just to give you an idea of kind of size. I didn't show you because it was too tricky. You're, you're looking at poppy seed size. So yeah, with these, you probably only want to put in one. So yeah, this is saying four centimeters deep. So you need to go a bit deeper. So no, I will not be putting these in here. It's saying that I can grow these in a greenhouse. So I might try doing that instead because I don't have an awful lot of space in here. But again, you would just kind of do this. I'm just going to do another cell for these specifically and just put it in the greenhouse because I've got space in there. I don't have that much space in here. So space in here and limited. Same thing with perpetual spinach. Perpetual spinach can go straight into the ground and it should be okay. But this I'm going to put into the polytunnel at the allotment, basically. The, the dill is telling me that I can't do it this way, but I bought dill in a pot last year and eventually ended up putting it somewhere else. So that should be fine. So I will be doing the dill. And dill is something that I use an awful lot in cooking, especially in the summer and in the winter months as well. So I might dry some of this out if I have enough of it. But the other thing that I didn't do last year is I wasn't too aware of getting things like herbs in the plot. And I only wanted to do vegetables. I'm just like, no, no, no. I can do herbs in the house garden. Never did that, though. Some of this is going through the plot this year. And the difference with that is that it's because I found out that a lot of the herbs actually keep away some of the pests that you might have to deal with. <laughs> uh, if you've not had to deal with aphids yet indoors, they are. So much more fun outdoors. So making sure that this is kind of planted right. So I'll make sure that the rest of this is okay. Again, these are probably going to be tiny seeds. No, they can go a meter, a centimeter and a half deep. How are these? Yeah, these are not too bad. They basically are fennel seeds. So I don't know whether or not you're going to be able to see that if I take my face away. Hopefully that is kind of coming up, but I want to put maybe a couple of seeds in on top of the soil is kind of what I'm going to do. And then I'm just going to push them in, essentially make sure that they're a bit of a distance between them. So they're not right next to each other. And then at least that way around, you can make sure that when you're pushing them in, that it's fine. I'm just using the back of the pencil and just pushing them in. Need to find where they are. Do it that way and do it this way. And that one's in there. You can pre-do the holes, the in the holes, but I find that is a way to me, basically. So I will be putting a lot of dill. And again, for any of the Greeks out there, you know why I'm putting dill. And for the Greeks out there, anithos. Oh, the seeds even smell like dill. It's hysterical. I won't bore you to death by seeing me do every single seed out there because it takes a bit of time. But the other thing that I was going to say, when you're watering these in, you would want to use, I'm trying to think now, a watering can. Potentially another thing you can do is just spray, like if you have a, a sprayer basically with water, spray the top first just so we've got some moisture and then use something with a rosette watering can just so that it spreads out rather than just one big gush of water so because that will probably again move too many things out then what will happen and hopefully i'll insert some clips here because i'll do that after i'm done all this is i will put them underneath the grow light which is going to be relatively kind of medium light to begin with because it doesn't really need to be there until the seedlings start popping out it's more the warmth that is needed at that point and then when they start growing a bit more you can start cranking up that grow light. And last year I was using really cheap grow lights. It didn't do too well because I didn't have too much control. This year, one of the grow lights that I've got right behind me there, you probably can't see it from the Monstera leaf. Maybe you can see it's on top of that propagation bin. I'm also using propagation bins, so you can reuse things that you're used to using. That one can go super bright. So I thought I was going to have to crank that up for my house plants and the tropical plants, I've only ever gone just shy of 
the full blast of this one, because I've got another one there now, should be more than enough for some of these other plants, like think tomatoes and things like that, sun-loving plants as well. Though Most of these things are going to be sun-loving. They are vegetables they are used to growing in full light most of the time. So having something like that that you can kind of crank up as they grow, and even something that you can lower and raise as they get higher, so much the better. I've got it really high now because I also want to catch some other pre-started plants that I got from shops as well. That's another way of doing it. If you don't want to go down the seed route and it's the first year that you're doing it, we did a lot of this last year with the allotment. Some of the stuff was pre-started from garden centers and things like that. And that's absolutely fine. Big box stores will have it. I got some of my stuff from b and Anecdotally, I can tell you some stories. I got this many cells of beetroot. I didn't realize each one was going to create three to four beetroots. I'm going to put it down. Just to give you context, I had at some point about 10 kilos of beetroot in the freezer, which have since become, I think I made over five liter jars of pickled beetroot. And I was also harvesting the leaves because the beetroot leaves taste a bit spinachy and you can eat them. They're lovely, actually. Just don't take all of them off because the beetroot under the ground needs that to grow, basically. But things like that could be a game changer. I got... <laughs> I think said this. I didn't realize that Khalees had a farm, but she said this in uh, one of her recent videos because things she's learned. First thing she said, she just said, bunnies are not cute. Bunnies are the enemy. They really are. <laughs> bunnies have chewed away most of my vegetables at some point or other because I was used to just dealing with the pests. I can deal with bugs. Give me bugs and I can deal with them even outdoors. It's stressful more so outside than it is inside because I can't use beneficial insects in the same way. But yeah, that I can deal with. Oh, what I was completely unprepared for was rabbits or birds eating all of the fruit or what was it? Uh, hmm. I thought I had a mole. I didn't have a mole. I had a vole. That was fun. Last year, I had to replant and restart my all of my brassicas, so kales, um, Brussels sprouts, things like that, broccoli, things like that, four or five times because the vole just kept eating the roots and then just dumping the, the rest of the plant on top of the soil level just as an ultimate F you basically. I'm just like, oh, lovely. So I need to figure out a way to deal with that this year. Somebody at the allotment said I could get some of those windmills that you get for like small kids, usually at the seaside, and just shove the stick part into the soil. And because of the wind and the vibrations in the soil, they don't like it because they think that somebody's there. Whether or not that's going to work, I don't know. But if you've got any really good tips, on how I can deal with a vole problem at the allotment, let me know. Because the other thing, again, for the people that are not based here in the UK, a lot of the allotments, including mine, can't use chemicals, can't use pesticides, kind of like you can't do a lot of, so, because and it makes sense, because anything that goes onto your plants or into the soil will affect other people's plots. And if people are trying to grow things relatively organically, you're kind of messing that up for them. So everybody's on the same base level. It does make things a bit more challenging at times, especially if you're not that bothered about growing organically. A lot of people are, and that's why they're doing this. So yeah, <laughs> humane ways, because the other thing is, well, you don't want dead bulls or dead rabbits lying around because that then promotes rats coming into it. And that causes a whole host of other issues. So <laughs> it's been a learning curve. Right. But I think I've prattled on for too long. I really do hope I bring out this video because I might just look at this in editing and just go, I've probably sp like been speaking for way too long on this one and I haven't shown quite as much. We, we did some seeds. We did some seeds and I told you some of the tips and things that I've used like with the tagging. It sounds dumb because everybody just, just use this, but it's really easy for everybody to just go, I'm just not going to do it. I've forgotten about it. Do this. This over everything else. Do this, you will thank me later. Not only when you know what the seedlings are, but also when you've planted things out. If you're not used to seeing some of these vegetables and you're seeing them for the first time, you're just like, I don't know what's there. I've planted something there. And just, yeah, it's better if you know, basically. But yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed. This is very different and out of my comfort zone entirely. But do let me know if you want more of these types of videos, because in the next video I could do, I can take you with me 
to the allotment and show you a couple of the bits there and how it's getting set up. So yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully I shall see you here soon. And I truly, truly hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.